So, yeah, hi everyone, sorry for the late start. Okay, yeah, I'm going to be presenting Hyperion Development. We're a community based and education sort of student startup. Um, okay, we were started by Riaz Muller. He's currently at the University of Pennsylvania and studies at Edinburgh full time. He went over there and found that like the difference in education was massive and thought he'd come back and try and share some of what he'd learnt and so the difference in level of course with South Africans and then sort of just got more and more involved in community development. Okay, so who we are, yeah, we're a group of undergraduate and postgraduate students from different backgrounds, it's humanities, sciences and computer science. We're from Italy, Australia, Scotland, South Africa, and America at the moment, and we're just trying to find anyone that wants to get involved and is interested in sort of developing technological education. Although, yeah, most of our community development is centered around South Africa and South African-based projects, as this is where well, most of the founders are from and where we see as the biggest area that we can improve on actively. So this is Riaz. It's not a mugshot. He just likes the Edinburgh picture. <laughs> um, yeah, so he decided his overreaching goal was to develop a community of people interested in doing something in technological-based education or just developing the industry in South Africa. He's studying artificial intelligence and computer science at Edinburgh, but he's on exchange at the Wharton School of Business in Pennsylvania and doing some bioinformatics there. Yeah, this is the team that we have here. It's Edward, Richard, and myself, and we're trying to promote our initiative. Yeah, we're going to take you through our whole kind of business model. We thought that would be the plan because we're just trying to find people who want to get involved in the different aspects of what we do. I know a lot of you are probably just programmers who aren't really going for too much community work at the moment, but I'll try and make it as brief as possible. Yeah, the top tier that we've made is developers. We don't, it's not a software engineering sort of developer context. It's just people interested in developing what we're doing in South Africa. We're all studying different things and it's just if you want to be involved and we've split geographically because we're based in Durban and Johannesburg at the moment and we're all just trying to get involved with the students that we have closest to us and help them set up our program on their computers or whatever they can access. No, we're trying to spread to Cape Town at the moment, and we've met some people that seem interested in doing it. But yeah, we do also have some national kind of projects, but yeah, no student base in Cape Town yet. Yeah, our Durban team is 10 developers at the moment across four campuses in Durban, and we've got about 140 students from three of those institutions. I'll go through what we're teaching them a bit further along, but yeah. Joburg has seven developers, and we've got 110 students from the two institutions we've approached so far. We're going to be going to the other two that our developers are from in the next couple of months, or a couple of weeks, actually. Then in Edinburgh, we've got only three developers there, but they're all top students who are working on developing tasks for us, because we found one of the most attractive things students find is sort of developing their intelligence and their education in computer science. We're currently running machine learning, artificial intelligence, and bioinformatics courses, or basics, based upon the Edinburgh lectures. And yeah, then we've got some people at Philadel in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania who are trying to develop products that might help us access students across South Africa and give them access to computers, largely with Raspberry Pis and adapting them to sort of the context we can use them in South Africa. So yeah, it's a university-centric organization. I think Google Docs is being grumpy. Okay, well, what we do, we took this from the underpants gnomes of South Park. We figured we could go out, hand out some forms with links to online Python resources, wait two weeks for expert programmers to emerge, and then profit. That's the wonderful diagram that took us to that conclusion. That didn't really work out, so we tried to develop ourselves a program that might work. We started off just providing free training to students that don't have much experience in computer science and fundamental and advanced programming concepts, doing research-based topics, like what I said earlier, in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and bioinformatics, 
engaging with them face to face, which our developers have been willing to do, and trying to find them paid work opportunities, because that's one of the things that really attracts students to us. They can see sort of work experience and making a bit of money and yeah. Then finding some solutions to giving people access to computers and involving students in a network where possibly after they leave university they can find people who might want to collaborate on sort of tasks that they have or projects they want to engage in. Yeah, outreach. One of the biggest outreach programs in South Africa, I think, is Jumpstart SA. They've got 24 schools that they work with, with 3,500 learners. We're trying to get Raspberry Pis to their schools and help sort of distribute them like that and let sort of younger people get access to computers while they can still learn rapidly. And yeah. So developing, we're trying to find hardware and software solutions that will help us in this goal, develop software for clients and provide work experience adapt our course content to make it as accessible as possible and try and do this as quickly as possible so students can progress. Okay, I'm going to go through how we do it and the approach that we've taken through quite a lot of trial and error. We've just been advertising through lectures and whatever university mailing systems there are. Students can register online or just through paper registration forms if they don't have access to the internet. We gather information about students and try and tailor the course as much as possible to them and find people that can help them move through it as quickly as possible and at whatever rate they want to. And we've developed a Hyperion situation system that helps us model exactly how we approach each student based upon their background and situation. Yeah, this is a background of the students that we've got in the last 30 days. About 50% of them don't have any access to, the com to computers or internet. And yeah, that's one of our primary problems, although we've been managing to get them to LANs or any other possible way of sort of letting them access our course. Okay, well, that's just a pie chart of who we've got in the last little while. It's obviously not done properly, but the blue piece is the University of Johannesburg, which is we just moved to them in the last couple of weeks and we had a huge influx of students. Okay, so yeah, students work at their own time and we have a number of different languages and learning tools that we've developed. We offer mostly Python courses, which is why we're here, and we try to take it beyond that for students who are interested in developing their knowledge and sort of more research-based topics if they haven't had access to those at an undergraduate level. Do, how many people here know what Dropbox is or have worked with it? Okay, yeah. Uh, well, we just use Dropbox and Notepad++ to communicate with students. Students sort of will get, I'll go through exactly what they get to start, and then they'll share what they do on Dropbox, open up Notepad++ and comment on any problems they have, and yeah, I'd notify our tutors on the desktop, or they'll go and check in, and then they can help a student through any issue that they're having. Yeah, it's an example of the events log and someone giving student hints. System. Okay, our, our Python courses go from introductory, intermediate to advanced. Introductory is just people with no background at all in computer science, and we've actually managed to teach some of these people like some basics and move them into intermediate courses, which is just sort of I don't know, learning to make effective and useful programs with Python. And then advanced is obviously those courses we've modeled on University of Edinburgh courses and Pennsylvania. This is basically what it'll look like when a person gets their first task. They just get a folder with task one, Dropbox link, and a welcome file that kind of guides them through how the course is going to work. It'll contain an instruction file, some example path and code for each aspect that you'll kind of need to move through a task, and sort of with a long explanation that's commented in. So if you don't, re if you aren't interested in knowing how a variable works. You can kind of just skip through it. You can see the code clearly, and that's how I've learned to program again since not programming to, from school. Okay. Yeah, that's the files. We've got a bunch of PDFs that we've been distributing that seem to have more appeal than sort of just opening up text files with programming and comments. And yeah, it makes it more accessible for students. It's very self-explanatory and it seemed to work very well. Yeah, here's an example of code teaching someone how to declare variables and 
how to do it. Okay, yeah, so this is how we structured our courses. We go with an introduction into basic programming and strings and control structures, additional and more difficult control structures, simple data structures, input and output of text files, and a basic string search with an entrance bioinformatics. Then intermediately, it's similar, but sort of not so spread out because tutors sort of have to go task by task and help people that have no idea what they're doing to get through the initial tasks. But yeah, the, the interesting things that we found some people at PyCon might want to engage in is an intro into bioinformatics, natural language processing, and machine learning, which is Edinburgh is the top, or well, arguably the top, artificial intelligence university in the world. And those courses are largely modeled on their slides, lectures, and videos, and those are linked with everything that you do. In advanced is the Amazon Cloud Artificial Intelligence from a more advanced in course, Computational Complexity, and then some Django, if anyone's unacquainted with it. Yeah, so it's all been adapted from actual courses. It's not just students that are trying to make something that works. And it has been quite effective in taking people through these sort of areas of computer science. That's just to quote that. We found that we could get a lot of people involved. One of the biggest problems with students especially is getting them to actually do something after they register. You kind of have to follow up, give them everything they need, and get them to engage with it. So yeah, I'll take you through this briefly. Or well, we've got people that are required to meet as developers. They meet with students in person. They are present online at least several hours a day or just are there and available to give a couple of comments and help people out a bit. And we recognize that all our students are largely incredibly different in background and level of programming. So you do actually need to give personal help to a lot of people with learning the basics of programming. Another huge problem we had is getting access from students and the proxies that are at lands at universities because they just will not allow you to access them at all or install anything. They won't even allow you to install a Python compiler on their computers or give you permission to load Dropbox. <sighs> okay, so we do this with the Hyperion Situation System, which is modeled on students coming from three backgrounds. Either you have access to computers and the internet and are effectively in a first world situation. Or, okay, here's an example of two people. One is just a programming student with full access to everything they might need to learn to program. The other is a sociology student who can only really access computers through LANs which don't have any of these resources and they can't access them. What do we do? Okay, yeah, so we've modeled, made a model of how to approach every situation that people might fit into and try to quantify the amount of students falling into each situation and assign groups of developers to help them out with getting to where they need to be. This was our diagram that we sort of set out so people can tell us exactly where they are. And it's just, you don't have your own computer, you can use LANs to access lessons via the whole proxy issue, then you have your computer and internet that you will use or you have no access to computer LANs or computers at all. So situation one is probably someone that's going to go for advanced courses. And situation two, you'd sort of take them in from the beginning and try and teach them the whole way through. Loading. Yeah, these are some of the guides that we've developed to help people work through some basic stuff. Well, this is how people will access our course if they don't have a computer and are going through LAN. So they can get to the internet, use tinyurl and have a sign up form and get people onto Dropbox, can access Dropbox through the Dropbox website. So we work with them through that and found an online Python compiler, which people can use, which sculpt, which has very few differences to actually using Python. It just seems like there's a little raw input or you declare it differently. Okay, our situation three, we're trying to get a large scale distribution of Raspberry Pis. That's like basically the biggest thing that we're trying to do. That's what we actually came here to try and find people to help us do. 
And yeah, we've got a network of people. Jumpstart would help us distribute this across the country. We've got some funding from the University of Edinburgh at the moment, but when it comes to the situation in South Africa, which is sort of a huge number of people that could benefit from this, we're looking to find more people who are interested in working on it with us. We've called it Project Indemon, which is a, it's based on the poem by John Keats, which is where our name came from. But yeah, Durban and Philadelphia are largely working on this. We found some funding in Philadelphia of all people that fund that might be interested in doing this. And we're kind of just looking to meet people that would want to help out with distributing them or involved in schools and community development as is. Yeah, we're trying to do this around Jumpstart and the schools they've set up because they have a network where they send teachers out constantly and try and help them educate students in maths and science. Our short-term objectives, obviously, is set up a base in Cape Town. That's what we're trying to do for now. There's plenty of students here and just people or with the whole Silicon Cape initiative. Hopefully, this would be the best place to get things going. We're growing our Johannesburg group, and we're going to try and get or as many students as possible involved because if you look at it, students are the people that have lots of time to waste. They want to do productive things, get somewhere that will hopefully give them more points if they're for going into any career in computers. So we're just trying to get them involved, get them to use some of their time a little more productively, and most people are quite excited to do that. Yeah, we're currently pro prototyping sort of uh, Raspberry Pi development that will make it more accessible power-wise because that's actually one of the biggest issues in rural communities. A lot of them don't even have access to electricity and if they do, it's limited. So yeah, we're trying to adapt that with a lot of the engineers that we have on board with us and working with the Durban Linux group and doing that. Some of the projects we're doing is we've been approached by the Department of Education to train some of their IT teachers that's an ongoing process and it's quite tough to get responses and work with them, but we seem to be making progress and will hopefully be doing that soon. The art, there's barely any RT in Durban at the moment, and this is the case of their education department. And like even a lot of private schools don't offer computer science at a high school level. So yeah, hopefully we're going to try and change that a bit. We might be doing a linguistics workshop relating to natural language processing at UKZN and their department seem keen to do that. And yeah, we're working with the Durban Linux Group or Durban Radio Amateurs Club on Raspberry Pass. How you can help, we can if you get involved. Um, yeah, if you're a student, academic, or professional interested in becoming a developer or doing anything towards any of the goals that I tried to enunciate, or very interested in Raspberry Pis, we'd really like you to contact one of us or get involved in any way possible. You'd like to do a task and see if people enjoy learning it or just share some of your knowledge with students across South Africa, that would be amazing. Yeah. And then long term, we're trying to build it in. One of the biggest focuses is just building a network of students and professionals in the technology industry that will hopefully be interested in working together and sort of collaborating on any project they're involved in and then offer stable part-time work to the students that we have because that's in a large way a lot of the reason that we get some of our top students in. They just want some web development or software engineering jobs that it's really tough to obtain as a student of computer science. Yeah, and see all of our underprivileged students without, an access, without access to computers get to being programmers. Yeah. So this is how you could help us. And an inspirational speech from Trevor Manuel discussing the situation in South Africa. Well, the programming, I mean the education situation in South Africa. Go to Google Docs. There. Yeah, we're currently kind of boots, bootstrapping. We recently did get some funding, and we're looking to get more funding from the University of Pennsylvania, who are actually very keen. We've gone into a non-disclosure agreement about a project that should actually get us a lot more funding, and they want to expand a network across South Africa. So anyone who'd like to get involved in that, that would be great. 
we're just trying to develop our course structure and network and yeah we'd love to see all or any of you get involved there are our details and there is our inspirational poem if anyone has any questions you'd like to ask or you could ask Edward or Richard at any other point okay Well, we don't have like, yeah, we obviously don't have a lot of experience, but we do have people working with Raspberry Pis at the Durban Linux group. And yeah, we've got a couple of engineers that have hardware experience. We've introduced it to a group in Pennsylvania who said that they're deciding on what material they want to work on this kind of project with, whether it's a Raspberry Pi or a more expensive alternative, but we're obviously pushing that and seeing if we can sort of get a Raspberry Pi to work for this purpose. Yeah. But we haven't really tested it fully as yet. That's kind of still going. How long have you been running? Only three months, actually. Yeah. Well, I think three or four, probably. Yeah. But it seems to be going well, and a lot of people are very interested, and we're trying to move forward as quickly as possible. Are you familiar with the Chuck Foundation? No. What is the Chuck Foundation? Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't have anyone in the Western Cape as yet. We're trying to get out here, and that's amazing. Well, that's kind of what we're trying to do. I suppose we should contact them. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that would be, or if you send us an email with, yeah, their details would definitely like to get in contact with them. We're still kind of trying to network with as many interested people as possible. Well, it's all, yeah, it's just all online. Like, it's, I don't know if all of the sort of answer, well, the full completed code is up there. It's mostly like you get a task. It's got a couple of examples that of the different elements you might need to complete the task and then yeah, they get given the end result when they sort of finish it or like a perfect result. But if you wanted to see how things work, I'm sure you'd be happy to sort of just give you the code and you could look at it. Yeah, it's No, it's all sort of undergrad. Well, there's quite a few postgraduate students that are kind of well working and have their own money and are just kind of getting involved because it's an interesting initiative. But it's not like we're students that are just going to fall away and be like, okay, this didn't quite work out, we're over it. Now we've kind of all been putting money into it, putting a lot of time into it, and it seems to be going somewhere sustainable. Yeah. I'm not, oh yeah, I'm not fully sort of informed on all the platform. I'm not like the, the sort of main guy that's going and trying to find all the opportunities possible. But yeah, there's, I could put you, if you can forward us all of these kind of things, that would be amazing. We're trying. <laughs> in communities that don't have computers like yeah yeah but like just based around that we I don't know it is looking quite promising that we will be able to do or actually get involved in that initiative with people funding it from overseas but yeah we that's more of it's not like using online they, I don't think they have they aren't going to have internet where we're planning on 
It's people without any access to computers that don't get trained in any computer skills. It's not necessarily going and training them in programming. It's like just give them computer skills and then maybe if we can introduce programming, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, what is the sort of feasible um, alternative? It's hard, particularly, I mean, I've, I've worked with the Shop Work Foundation project, and okay. a lot of um, high school Linux and schools, and different kinds of things. Okay. Giving people free stuff is very hard, mm. and there's nothing easy about what you're trying to do. Yeah, we don't, ex we do have, I don't know, we are kind of going at it as it happens, but if we can get funding to do it, and we've got, I don't, we've got about 20 people that are like really actively involved in tutoring and training and sort of just moving forward and trying to find people who want to get involved. I don't know, we can try and do that. And there is a network of schools with Jumpstart that obviously are benefiting from maths education and are interested. So, well, we're going to try, but I don't, know, I don't, I can't really dispute what you're saying. I don't have experience in that yet, but yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. We are kind of moving towards, we're developing a website that has all of these functions sort of in one website so people don't have to get directed around and they can just go on, there's Dropbox access, a compiler and all of the tasks there for them. But yeah, that's kind of a new thing and we've had to employ, well we've got sort of a professional programmer that's also helping us with that because most of our people aren't sort of incredibly experienced web developers and we want it to be sort of perfectly running and get it up soon. But yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for all the suggestions and criticism because we obviously haven't heard of a lot of this feedback. <laughs> suggestions, well, that's the valuable part, I think. Yeah. Like, if we can take stuff away from this, that's great. So, yeah, I'm going to have to come and find you guys and hopefully get it's a lot of different initiatives that we didn't know about. So, yeah, thanks for attending and informing us of things we didn't know. <laughs> Thank you.